What makes a man, Mr. Lebowski? Traditionalists tend to define manhood under the criteria of qualities attributed to masculinity, anatomy, and heterosexuality. However, none of this criteria pins down what it is to be a man because the concept of manhood fluctuates over time, over varying cultures. Sometimes there's a man, well, uh, he's the man for his time and place. Much of it is confined within a binary that does not allow for the full picture or full spectrum of who we are as human beings. This sometimes causes cisgender men to define their masculinity solely with their anatomy, as it seems universal to them. It's actually not universal, but we'll get to that later. Without batting an eye, a man will refer to his dick, or his rod, or his Johnson. Johnson? Masculinity is so rooted in anatomy that manhood is both a common synonym for masculinity and a common synonym for penis. The two become intertwined, masculinity and genitals, and any threat to one is a threat to the other. It's an extremely simplistic outlook on what it is to be a man. Indeed, it is an extremely simplistic outlook on sex and gender in general. What makes a man is culturally diverse, and what it means to be a man is not easily pinned down. As masculinity is comprised of a multitude of factors, some physical, some cultural, and some, well, arbitrary, that defining manhood with your Johnson is both reductive and maybe even laughable. Any biologist, sociologist, or anthropologist could tell us that. If a cisgender man loses his penis in an accident, is he no longer a man? If a man's chromosomes are not XY, as is sometimes the case, is he not a man? Perhaps masculinity is like a club, and other men decide whether or not you're in the club. Sociologists tell us, oddly enough, that that's not far off as the rigid binary and masculinity are socially enforced, sometimes to the detriment of men. This narrow view of manhood and social policing contribute to simplistic, even binary views of masculinity, sex, sexual orientation, and gender. To a traditionalist, all these things contain one thing or a diametrically opposed other. Cisgender heterosexual masculinity is the cultural pressure exerted on men to be masculine and cisgender in traits as well as heterosexual in orientation or else be viewed as feminine and or socially unacceptable. Gender self-discrepancy is how well men think they fit cultural expectations of how they should act, which attributes a perceived importance of possessing masculine attributes. It's a cultural ideology which extends the belief that masculinity and femininity consists of a binary set of behaviors, traits, social roles, and anatomy. From a young age, children learn to value masculine attributes over feminine attributes as more socially effective and rewarding. This encodes a binary for them. For example, while independence, success, and achievement are part of society's construct of masculinity, these culturally valued qualities remain absent from the construct of femininity. Success is coded masculine by a society that elevates men as breadwinners and ties one's success to one's masculinity. This intertwining of success to masculinity makes a woman being successful appear as a threat to cisgender heterosexual masculinity. Women who become successful are compared to men or whispered about as someone stealing a job from a man, a diversity hire, or someone who only achieved status through sexual coercion rather than someone who simply earned her position like any man would have. I'll suck your cock for a thousand dollars. <laughs> this is only one example of how one's actions are coded masculine and feminine, and how such coding can potentially be damaging, if one sees this binary as true, natural, and good. Cisgender heterosexual masculinity deems heterosexuality one of the essential conditions of masculinity. Men known to be or even perceived as gay have their masculinity robbed by traditionalists who conflate heterosexuality with masculinity. 
Due to the mistaken belief that homosexuality is an aberrant lifestyle which violates the binary view of masculinity and femininity, many heterosexual men view gay men as a threat to their self-identities as men. In truth, sexuality is a spectrum. People are not simply gay or straight. Those terms are actually fairly recent. Some people are bisexual, some people are pansexual, and among bisexuals and pansexuals, there exists more variations in the spectrum. For example, some bisexuals are also biromantic, meaning having both sexual and romantic feelings for two sexes. Whereas some bisexuals have sexual feelings for two sexes, but only romantic feelings for one. Some people are asexual, meaning have no sexual feelings for anyone. There is a great amount of flexibility in sexuality. A binary view of sexuality both marginalizes anyone who isn't heterosexual as some kind of deviant other, but even the binary view of gay and straight erases bisexuality. Our current definitions do not fully capture the whole picture. These words are merely shorthand and helpful in explanations. I was talking about my rug. You're not interested in sex? You mean coitus? Sexuality is not neatly divided into boxes, certainly not two boxes but exists in near-infinite variation. Cisgender heterosexual masculinity causes heterosexual cisgender men to internalize society's gender expectations and consequently develop anxiety over not fulfilling those expectations. This anxiety leads many heterosexual men to reject gay men as a means of reaffirming their sense of masculinity. This is another consequence of binary thinking as it relates to gender roles and sexuality. Masculinity, much like sexuality, is a spectrum, as evidenced by the fact that what is popularly considered masculine varies from culture to culture. For example, Greek culture and American culture have notably different attitudes toward masculinity and the act of crying. Among many Greeks, crying is considered passionate. Among many Americans, crying is considered feminine or a sign of weakness. And within the rigid structure of cisgender heterosexual masculinity, feminine and weak are conflated as one. That is yet another example of the consequences of binary thinking, as suppressing emotions can have severe psychological results. You're entering a world of pain. Binary thinking as it relates to biology, the false notion of only two sexes, results in a lot of misinformation and ignorance. Sex is not rigidly defined. Intersex people, for example, are individuals born with any of several variations in binary sex characteristics, including chromosomes, gonads, sex hormones, or genitals. Within the intersex spectrum, there is also a lot of variation. Sex is not simply male, female, and intersex because intersex people vary greatly. If we view sex as three instead of two, that is only marginally less ignorant than the binary. It is more accurate, and indeed more honest, to view sex as a spectrum. Scientists and surveys generally place the intersex percentage of the world population between 1.5% and 2%. Now, 2% might not seem like much, but that's approximately 154 million people. The population of, say, Canada is only 37 million. There are more intersex people on Earth than there are people in Canada, the United Kingdom, and Australia combined. In terms of biology, there are about as many intersex people as there are people with red hair, but no one says that there are only two hair colors the way some people try to claim that there are only two sexes. There are about as many intersex people as there are people with green eyes, but no one says there are only two eye colors. Even among hair and eye color, there is a spectrum of variation. Red hair comes in a few shades, blue eyes come in a few shades, and so forth. As for transgender people, Surveys approximate the population is slightly less than 1%, but as shown, even 1% of the world population is massive. Now, this is important. These categories help us converse about sexuality, sex, and gender to communicate sexual needs, desires, and expectations, not to mention self-identification. Nobody is claiming it's bad to identify strongly with a word or designation. It can be very affirming and can have significance and great meaning to the individual. Sex, gender, and sexuality need not be destroyed, only its definitions and scope broadened. Traditionalists who argue in favor of these binaries are trying to enforce a social order or social reality that conflicts with the facts about the spectrum of variation. 
They don't argue that people with green eyes don't exist, and they don't argue that people with green eyes are deviations, because people with green eyes don't violate their mistaken worldview or threaten cisgender heterosexual masculinity, which they find comforting. Bear in mind that the binary is not enforced solely by cisgender heterosexual men, but society grants them more influence and sway to move the conversation. Categorizing the world into two sets, men and women, gay and straight, things like that, makes the world easier to explain to people and can be more easily visualized by many people. The human mind can more easily process two numbers than gigantic numbers. The binary is a human-made illusion that helps life feel simpler than it is. Sociologists would say that cisgender heterosexual men are even more likely to push back against anything that violates the binary due to how restrictive men can be at policing heterosexuality and traditional gender roles because they benefit from dominant gender roles more than women. Men who believe in and are supported by the traditional binary may see anything that violates said binary as out of bounds. Over the line! Huh? I'm sorry, Smokey. You were over the line. That's a foul. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, what condition my condition was in. When traditionalists attempt to enforce a non-existent binary, they sometimes cite their elementary school education rather than their higher learning. The traditionalist will mockingly state that they learned that useful fact in their elementary school textbook, the idea being that even children know this. However, what this actually reveals is that their knowledge of the subject is limited to elementary school. Elementary school students are not given the full picture of the world. Instead, they are given a rudimentary, sometimes outright false picture of the subject because a more complex picture is thought to be above their understanding by their teachers. In truth, children can almost certainly understand a somewhat more complex picture of sex and gender, but those with authority, themselves traditionalists, either sell them short or purposefully want them to not know this. For example, American elementary school students are often taught that Christopher Columbus discovered their country and proved that the world was round. Columbus did not discover the country. It was already populated. And he never set foot in what is now the United States of America, he explored the Caribbean, Central America, and South America. Also, educated people generally knew the shape of the Earth long before 1492. Elementary school students are also told lies by omission by obfuscating Columbus's treatment of the indigenous people. When students grow up, or perhaps when they simply use the internet to fact-check their teachers, they learn the complete picture. Hopefully. Thus, an argument that amounts to even children know this, does more to poke holes in their argument than reinforce it. Traditionalists try to use science to make their claim about binaries, but usually don't go past the first page in the biology textbook. For example, they try to codify sex through chromosomes. Two problems there. One, chromosomes actually come in a great number of varieties. The most common are indeed XX and XY, but some people only have one chromosome, and some people have three or more. And as said before, the most common variety does not somehow remove the other varieties, and the other varieties are contained within millions of people. And second, children are taught XX and XY. They are taught a binary. Students are taught that there are boys and girls and nothing in between. In fact, when changes to the curriculum are proposed that will give youngsters a more complete picture of sex, gender, and sexuality, Conservative groups protest these changes and often win. Their traditionalism is espoused under the guise of protecting the children. See, when they are proven wrong through science, they change the goalposts of why they are doing this. And then, when they are proven that knowledge does not hurt children, they will come up with another and another until one sticks among the voters, never having to reveal to others or even to themselves that they are doing this because the binary is more comforting to them, that traditionalism is more comforting to them. Another consequence of this binary is that it makes intersex, transgender, non-binary, or gay children feel further marginalized or even made to feel like they don't exist. For some traditionalists, that is the point. So, when traditionalists say that trans men are really women, that trans women are really men, that intersex people don't exist, 
or anything else that reinforces a non-existent binary, they are using a child's understanding of the subject as proof, and they themselves are fortifying a child's understanding of the subject by blocking changes to the curriculum. When students grow up, if they ever take a university-level course on biology or sociology, they will learn the truth. Again, hopefully. Not everyone takes university-level courses in biology or sociology, though, and some people just don't want to look it up on the internet. Courses that teach people things that violate a traditionalist worldview, no matter how wrong that worldview, are spoken of derisively by traditionalists, conservatives, and other anti-intellectual ne'er-do-wells. The phrase, gender studies, is the go-to insult for people who want to discredit well-understood biology and sociology on the subject. What is a man, or what makes a man, are challenging questions to answer once we recognize the spectrum and discard elementary school binary thinking. However, this is a limitation of the question. The question, what is a man, still presumes the binary. It is a question born out of the binary trying to find a non-binary answer. The question is really, what makes society believe I am a man, putting the onus on outside definitions? A cis man knows why society believes he is a man, and it's usually something similar to this. Isn't that what makes a man? Mm, sure, that and a pair of testicles. That's why society believes this is a man, a dude, and if that's enough for society, then that's enough for the man. He doesn't have to think about it if society accepts his manhood as a given. When we ponder traditional masculine traits that have nothing to do with anatomy, we learn that we can ask this a different way. Instead of, what is a man? We could ask, what makes me feel like a man? See, what is a man, or what is a woman, is a kind of gotcha question for people who believe in the binary. They can use a binary question to trap people because such a question requires an answer on their terms instead of the terms of the person being asked why they are a man or why they are a woman. The question is not meant to get an honest answer to help them understand each other, but to ensnare someone who is trans or non-binary in a question that can only be answered to the satisfaction of the person asking it. The very premise of the question can be rejected. For example, if a Christian asks a Buddhist, Jew, or atheist, why do you hate my God? There is no answer. The question is being framed on a false assumption, a difference in religious background being mistakenly equated to hatred of other religious backgrounds. The premise of the question can be rejected, and instead a new question under new terms can be asked. What makes you a man, or what makes you a woman, can be rejected and replaced with what makes me feel like a man or woman as a question for oneself. If you're looking for one answer, then that's very simplistic thinking. It's thinking within the binary, not the spectrum, not the complex answer. And the answer will vary, and based on the aforementioned variations, that's to be expected. And that's okay. Traditionalists, transphobes, and other assorted ne'er-do-wells ask their questions with the conclusion already reached. They ask these questions based on old assumptions, and if those assumptions have been disproved by both biologists and sociologists, or at least are under greater scrutiny, then they can be rejected and replaced with new and better questions. When traditionalists, transphobes, and assorted others respond in frustration and sarcasm with something like, Oh, so anyone can be anything, right? They come dangerously close to getting the point and dismissing the gender binary, but only rarely have that epiphany. They retreat into old arguments like, Then I can identify as a car. People can be men. Evidence? You have met some. You have not met a human-car hybrid. Memes are not good arguments. Argument ad absurdum is a logical fallacy and it disproves your position, not the position of your target. It's a child's interpretation of both sex and gender. Boys have a penis, girls have a vagina. <laughs> Put more simply, asking a binary question only gets a binary answer. Traditionalists don't want to hear anything about spectrums, so the premise of the question removes that so that you can't answer it that way. 
you can only answer it on their terms and to their satisfaction. Perceiving gender, gender traits, sex, and sexuality as spectrums is both scientifically correct and liberating. An epiphany that can remove the aforementioned negative consequences, that is, if we are brave enough to start seeing the world as it is, and not the world in its simplest form. Yeah, well, you know, that's just like uh, your opinion, man. Yeah.